What's going on all of my healthcare brothers and sisters? I hope that you are having a wonderful day. Today we're going to take a closer look at myocardial infarction surgical interventions. Let's get started. So to begin, what is available surgically when it comes to myocardial infarctions? So we have a couple different things. We have percutaneous transluminal coronary angioplasty, also known as PTCA. It's also known as percutaneous coronary intervention, also known as a PCI. So a lot of uh, facilities will use them interchangeably. We have coronary artery stents, as well as coronary artery bypass grafting, also known as a cabbage. Um, really the goal when it comes to surgical interventions is we want to restore perfusion as soon as possible. So to begin, let's take a closer look at percutaneous coronary interventions, also known as PCI. So it's an invasive non-surgical technique in which one or more coronary arteries are dilated with a balloon catheter to open the vessel lumen and improve arterial blood flow. So usually the access points in order to access um, the coronary arteries is we're going to either go in femorally through the groin or radially through our wrists. So this really is an emergent intervention when it comes to our STEMI patients. Um, patients can experience a reocclusion after the procedure and it may often need to be repeated. So if we have a procedure where they did not place a stent but we only ballooned it to open it, a lot of times reocclusion can occur. So it's really important that we have to monitor these patients very closely post PCI um, for these reocclusions. Complications from this procedure can include arter um, arterial dissection or rupture of the coronary artery. You could have an embolism that takes place due to plaque fragments being broken off. The coronary arteries can actually spasm. And then lastly, um, the patient could experience an acute MI if there's either a partial or total occlusion of the coronary artery. And typically when a patient is admitted to the hospital, as soon as they come into the ER, for my ER nurses out there, or my aspiring ER nurses, is that we have a 90 minute door to balloon time, meaning that as soon as they hit the door and they're registered, we have 90 minutes to get them assessed and into cardiac catheterization to get that balloon placed um, within 90 minutes. So when the decision is made that the patient needs a percutaneous coronary intervention, PCI, the procedure begins with a coronary angiography. And this uses a special dye, also known as a contrast dye, and x-rays to see how blood flows through the arteries in the heart. Once a problem is identified, they can use a balloon angioplasty and or stent placement depending on how severe that occlusion is. So when it comes to balloon angioplasty, the procedure is used to open narrowed arteries by floating a long, thin tube called a catheter that has a small balloon on its tip into that blocked artery. The balloon is inflated in that artery and it helps flatten or compress the plaque against the artery walls. Like we said before, if we don't use stents, a lot of times we can have a reocclusion that takes place, so that's why it's important that we monitor them post-cardiac cath. If there is a determination that a stent needs to be placed, then a small mesh-like device made of metal is placed inside the coronary artery to provide support in keeping the vessel walls open. So when it comes to pre-procedure and post-procedures for PCI, pre-procedurally the provider may order pre-procedural medications such as aspirin to be given prior to the procedure. And then when it comes to post-procedure, we want to make sure that we're administering those anticoagulants and antipalatelets as prescribed to help prevent any kind of thrombus formation from occurring. Um, patients could te temporarily be on these medications or they can permanently be on these medications for their lifetime depending on what interventions were used. We could also look at giving IV nitroglycerin um, routinely or PRN to help prevent coronary artery vasospasms from occurring post-PCI. Um, we encourage fluids absolutely because this helps enhance the kidney's ability to excrete that contrast dye that was um, inserted during the procedure. And then absolutely we want to provide patient education on compliance of prescribed medications and why it's important to be taking a daily aspirin when it comes to our heart compromised patients. 
When we're looking at percutaneous coronary intervention post-procedural monitoring, we really want to be assessing for any kind of arrhythmias that take place as well as reocclusions that could lead to a potential myocardial infarction. We really want to make sure that we're looking at the femoral access site if that was the site used. Um, the patient should be laying flat in bed for approximately six hours post sheath removal, which is the picture that I show here, because there is a increased chance of them developing some kind of hematoma, which could be extremely severe um, post procedure when it comes to our femoral access patients. When it comes to our radial axis patients, um, bed rest really is limited to no more than four hours. There's really no limitations in regards to the positioning, like with our femoral axis, they really need to be laying completely flat. Whereas with our radial axis, they don't really need to be laying flat, they can actually sit up in bed. Um, the only thing that they do need to do is restrict their movement of their wrists, so they really need to keep their wrists straight um, post-procedural. We need to be assessing for distal perfusion of the arteries. So when it comes to our femoral approach, we need to be checking the foot. When it comes to our radial approach, we need to be checking our hand. And then lastly, with any kind of surgical procedure, incentive spirometry use, as well as early ambulation, once restrictions allow, is highly recommended um, for our post-surgical patients. Finally, let's take a closer look at the coronary artery bypass grafting procedure. So when we have occluded coronary arteries that require um, them to be bypassed due to the extent of the damage, meaning that the coronary arteries are not savable, this is a great option for patients because they use their own venous or arterial blood vessels. So some of the vessels that they can get are the saphenous veins, which are located in the legs. You can have internal mammary arteries as well as other arteries um, dependent on what the provider or the surgeon, I should say, wants. But typically, we see veins um, or vessels, I should say, that are taken from the legs. Um, patients may have a double, uh, I'm sorry, a single, double, triple, or quadruple bypass, depending on how many arteries have been affected. And usually the indication for this procedure includes a fail or not appropriate um, PTCA or PCI, the patient's experiencing cardiogenic shock, or there's some kind of mechanical complication from a STEMI, including a muscle rupture as well as valve damage. So what typically occurs during the coronary artery bypass grafting surgery? So to begin, veins or arteries are harvested from either inside the leg, the forearm, or behind the chest wall for the bypass of the coronary artery that's been affected. The surgeon is going to begin by opening up the chest by making an incision down the middle. They're going to cut through the breastbone and they're going to ultimately spread the rib cage. That way they have access to the heart. At that point, it's up to the surgeon to make the determination if they want to do the procedure off pump or on pump. If the surgeon decides to do it on pump, what that means is that the heart is going to be stopped while the surgeon performs the procedure. Tubes are going to be inserted into the heart so that the blood is pumped through the body using a lung heart bypass machine. If by chance the surgeon decides to do it off pump, then the heart is going to remain um, functionable during the surgery and the pump um, that is used to pump the blood throughout the body is going to be kept on standby in case it's needed during the procedure. The harvested veins and arteries are going to be attached to one of the blood vessel back to either the aorta or above the blockage um, where in the coronary artery, wherever that's taking place. And then once that has been determined that uh, the grafts look good, the patient looks good, everything's functioning appropriately, if they were on pump, we're going to turn the pump off and see if there's any bleeding, um, then we're going to start to close up the patient, close up the rib cage, um, and then close up the chest, place a nice little dressing over the top of it, and then they go to the cardiovascular ICU or open heart ICU where they will recover. So what needs to occur pre-procedure when it comes to a cabbage? So to begin with, we need to inform the patient that they need to expect a sternal incision, possibly even arm and leg incisions, um, one to four chest tubes, depending on what the surgeon places. A Foley catheter is also gonna be in place to help um, your, with urinary drainage and lots of IV fluid catheters, strips, um, and drains are going to be present once they come out of surgery. 
Um, we also need to inform the patient that there is going to be an endotracheal tube that will be in place for a short period of time, and they aren't going to have the ability to speak until it is removed. So typically, the patient will be um, awoken post-procedure with the endotracheal tube in place for that short period of time um, or until they have recovered enough to be able to breathe on their own. So based on personal experience, um, we wake the patient up, we take off all sedation once they come back as long as they're hemodynamically stable and they're okay, and then we start to wake them up. And once they're awake enough, uh, to have the endotracheal tube out, we start doing procedures to make sure that they are going to be able to breathe on their own once the tube comes out. Once they pass all of those tests, then we take the tube out. Um, and then typically after that occurs, uh, based on uh, enhanced surgical recovery standards, we typically get them in a chair immediately and have them sitting up. Uh, post-procedural. So it's really, it's, it's quite a ballet process when it comes to our patients. Um, again, a mechanical ventilator is going to be in place to help breathe for the patient. Post-operative pain is to be expected and make sure that the patient knows that we are going to provide pain medications as needed. And then of course, prescribed medications will be discontinued. Typically diuretics are gonna be discontinued two to three days prior to surgery, digoxin 12 hours prior to surgery, and any kind of aspirin or anticoagulants will be discontinued one week prior to surgery. So now let's take a look at post-procedural when it comes to our cabbage patients. So mechanical ventilation is typically maintained six to 24 hours after our surgery. However, usually um, it is discontinued around that six hour mark because that's really the gold standard. Sometimes you can get it a little bit before then, but really we don't want it in there longer than six hours. Um, invasive cardiac monitoring of the heart rate, rhythm, our pulmonary artery and arterial pressures are going to take place. We're gonna be looking at urinary output as well as neurological status um, frequently with these patients to make sure that we don't have any kind of compromise. Um, we could have mediastinal and pleural chest tubes to water seal drainage. Um, they could also be prescribed to suction if that is necessary. And then we really want to monitor for drainage. If we have drainage that exceeds 100 to 150 mLs an hour, we want to report that to the physician, um, or I should say the surgeon, because they ultimately might need to go back to the OR to figure out where the bleeding is taking place. Um, we don't want them dumping blood into their chest tubes post-procedure. Um, epicardial pacing wires are usually covered with a sterile cap in our um, tape to the patient's chest, or they can actually be connected to a temporary pacemaker generator depending on how the patient did post-procedure. Fluid and electrolytes are also monitored closely and fluids are usually restricted between 1500 to 2000 mLs because you don't want to have any unnecessary edema taking place post-procedure. And then lastly, blood pressure is monitored closely as hypotension can cause a collapse in the vein grafts that were placed. Um, so we really wanna make sure that we're monitoring that. Also hypertension can increase the chance of the suture lines leaking. So we really wanna make sure that we keep that blood pressure within a normal range as closely as possible so that we don't cause any unnecessary complications to the grafts. So additional post-procedural interventions include temperature monitoring and rewarming the patient if their temperature drops below 96.8 degrees Fahrenheit or 36 degrees Celsius. Now when it comes to rewarming your patient, you really don't wanna do it faster than 1.8 degrees per hour because we want to prevent that shivering from occurring. And once we reach 98.6 degrees Fahrenheit or 37 degrees Celsius, then we want to discontinue that rewarming from occurring. And then lastly, we wanna monitor for cardiac tamponade. So if a patient has a mediastinal chest tube uh, and all of a sudden you have the cessation of blood drainage coming out, we need to be looking at that systemic circulation for congestion, right? So if we have any kind of jugular vein distension from occurring, our lung sounds most likely will sound clear, right? Because we're not having any kind of left-sided issues, we're having those right-sided issues from occurring, so everything's gonna start backing up into the circulatory system because of the pressure from all the blood sitting in that pericardial sac pushing on our heart. So it's pushing on our heart, we can't get everything to the heart, so it starts backing up. 
You might even see um, equalization of the right arterial pressure as well as the pulmonary artery wedge pressure and potentially even pulses paradoxus. So when it comes to pulses paradoxus, it's that fall in systolic blood pressure during inspiration. So we really need to be monitoring our blood pressure very closely as well for these equalization changes of our pressures as well as our blood pressure. So the last couple of things that we want to be monitoring when it comes to our post-surgical cabbage patients is we need to be looking at arrhythmias because there is a potential for the graft to become rejected or even reocclude. So we need to be monitoring for those arrhythmias. Uh, we need to be looking at our midsternal incisions, our chest tubes, both our pleural and our mediastinal, as well as our external pacing wires. Um, Perfusion throughout the body, make sure that we're monitoring our pulses, giving the patient that incentive spirometry to use. Um, they usually get a pillow after surgery that they use for coughing. Um, it helps just kind of splint the incision so that they can take deep breaths um, and use that incentive spirometry because ultimately we want them to get those secretions out that could have accumulated from the endotracheal tube and not breathing appropriately. And we also want to prevent atelectasis from taking place, which is the collapsing of the alveoli in the lungs. So we want to make sure that patient's getting the oxygenation that they need. And then lastly, that ambulation as soon as that endotracheal tube is taken out. Like I said before, you know, once that endotracheal tube is taken out, they go straight to the chair. We don't want them laying flat. We want them sitting up. They most likely will still be very sleepy and that is okay, but we want them sitting up in that chair and getting up. So those are a couple things that we're gonna monitor and um, just the general overview of our myocardial infarction surgical interventions. I hope that this video is helpful in understanding surgical interventions when it comes to myocardial infarctions. If you have any additional questions, make sure that you leave them down below. I love answering your questions. Head over to my social media. I'm on Instagram and Facebook. And if you haven't done so already, make sure you subscribe here on YouTube and turn on that bell notification so that you're notified every time I post a new video. Additional resources will also be located on my website at www.nursechung.com. So head over there and check that out. But until next time, I hope you're having a wonderful day and I'll see you all again soon. Bye.